What we love in nature is that it's real. So you don't have scenarios or fake situations. I mean, like just play like situations, but it's really real. And having this sense of real responsibility very much attracts these youngsters because they see that these adults really trust me. So if we make, I have, I can make the fire, I get to cook and we eat the food for real, then it's getting a taste of responsibility more and more and trust. Hey everyone and welcome back to the Transnational Perspectives Podcast. This is the show where we put nature in focus while sharing perspectives on society and culture across environments and landscapes. I'm your host Josh Bennett, recording live here in Oslo, Norway, bringing you conversations with researchers, artists, activists, and all kinds of other people from all around the world who are here to share their experiences and their efforts, give us some inspiration and some tools that we need so that you and me and we and everyone else can start working together towards a socially and ecologically sustainable future today. As we like to say, we must attack the issues of social and ecological injustice at large from wherever we may sit or stand. The Trans Natural Perspectives podcast is brought to us by listeners like you. If you find value in this show and you want to help it grow, please consider sharing this podcast, writing a review, and supporting the show. Head on over to transnaturalperspectives.com to learn more about how you can contribute as a monthly subscriber, as a one-time donor, as well as check out our blog. I invite you to contact me with any ideas you have for the show. If you'd like to be a guest, if you need a writer or any other tips on further funding opportunities. All right, and on with the show. Welcome back, everyone. Today, we're taking our first trip to Hungary, where I get to talk with Arpad Barnai, who runs the Academy of Experience in Budapest. The Academy of Experience supports local foster care programs, particularly youth and Roma communities through offering outdoor and experiential education workshops, activities, and other community building exchange opportunities. I was pretty excited to talk with our pod because he really works within the core of what this podcast is all about, which is at the intersection of social, cultural, and ecological sustainability. In this case, engaging socially marginalized communities of various cultural backgrounds in nature and place-based activities with a focus on community connection through nature connections. As well, our pod is host of the Source podcast, all about the power of experiential education in different contexts, which you can find both in Hungarian and now in English. And you know what happens when two podcast hosts get together? The conversations can just go. So just give you a little heads up. The first half of this conversation is very focused on our pod, his upbringing and early key nature experiences and his journey towards becoming an experiential educator as well as Hungarian nature and culture connections. The second half of our talk is going to focus much more on his work with children in foster care and Roma youth around the Budapest region. You can check the timestamps for more guidance on the content. And with that being said, thanks so much everybody for tuning in and see you on the other side. Welcome to the show. Hey, thank you. Thank you for inviting and thank you for this introduction. Yeah, thanks for coming on to share your trans natural perspectives. I'm up here in Oslo, Norway. You're down in Hungary right now. Yeah. As we were talking a little bit before the show, we're both in lockdown still. If you're listening to this in the future, <laughs> yes, we're recording this during uh, the Corona lockdown of 2021 now here in Europe. And yeah, and uh, how how is the how is the the lockdown for you right now? How are you doing down there? Yeah, it's the third wave of mm -hmm. coronavirus for the region. I would say, like the countries around Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Hungary. And now we have the highest numbers ever regarding coronavirus. So it's, I would say, it's the most serious situation regarding the health issues and also it should be really a lockdown. And at the same time, I think people are kind of tired of 
of just being at home and being yes. in some kind of isolation, some degree of isolation. And it has a, like, there's the mental health and the physical health part. So we try to take care of our physical health. But I see that there's a lot of signs of mental health issues coming mm. up. Yeah, yeah, we should we should get into that a little bit. That's very interesting. I think yeah, around the world we're also I think up here in Norway getting people are getting getting it's getting a bit tired now. With, I think that's just around the world in general. And yeah, it's tough. So, Arpad, where are you exactly in Hungary right now? In Budapest. In yeah, Budapest. Capital. Okay. Yeah. Capital city. Okay, I've been there before, and I'm just curious. Before we get too too deep into our conversation, what is it? What in terms of of nature and environment in your in your in your place? What is it like there? Can you describe it for us a little bit? Yeah, you mean the country, like the broader region, or well, yeah, the broader region. But I'd also like to know just like in your yeah. neighborhood, what is it like yeah. there? Yeah, well, it's a good question. Yeah. Uh, I'm really happy that I moved here. Because mm -hmm. I used to live in the center of the city, and now I live in the outskirts, so mm -hmm. close to the airport. It it feels like I'm more in a village kind of environment, and we have a kind of forest. It's a forest, a small forest, just in the next street. So if I need to walk out and have a walk in woods, I can do that. But it's like smaller trees, so it's not a huge birch trees or or uh, an older one, no hills mm -hmm. around, mm -hmm. just on the other side of the capital in Buda. But this this is like yeah, smaller town, village like surroundings, yeah, so and and some some smaller forests to walk around. And nearby there's a lake, which uh, has been preserved. Uh, it's a swamp lake environment where where the traveling birds take a rest, and you can have very good word bird watching experience there. Yeah. It's always, it's always a question on the podcast, you know, where do we start first? Do we start per, uh, first with the person or the place? And I'm just, you know, I'm curious. So during this, especially during this lockdown period or even in normal times, like what kind of activities do you like to do? You know, how do you get out into nature on a regular basis? Yeah. If, if we could go away, I mean, away, mm -hmm. away, to some Hungarian hills, for example. It, it didn't happen quite often, but when we could, I felt like, wow, I'm on a journey. <laughs> I'm <laughs> so far away. But uh, on a regular basis, more more these walks in the nature mm. served us. Like in these two forests I mentioned, there was some something, even shorter walks helped a lot to clear the mind and also to to just feel that life is happening and you could like i could see the the rhythm of the year how how the vegetation changes and what what the animals are doing so it was good to get out of my head i would say mm. i don't know if this answers to your question yeah no it's a and i think it's a really important point too you know that it you know whether it is a lockdown time or just everyday life it's not every day that people can just get away you know there's this kind of old i almost think like kind of old you know stereotype that to go and have an adventure to have a or not even an adventure just to have a nice nature experience you kind of have to go away you have to go to some exotic location or mm -hmm. something like that which can be nice of course to see different things that uh, you're not you know accustomed to but on a daily basis it's it's nice to just get out into your neighborhood into your area and like explore your place and and so you say you live on the outskirts kind of the sub suburb uh, suburbs of budapest yeah, yeah. what is the what is the situation with like green space inside the city i mean this is a big capital city is it yeah it's a big issue i i, I feel it. on a personal note like i was born in the middle of a country in a smaller town okay. and it's flat land so it's like totally flat and i didn't realize how much i miss two things until i moved up to the capital and one thing was i grew up being used to seeing the sky like more of the sky mm. because it's you have a wide horizon and not so tall buildings i moved up to the city and i just saw a stripe of it mm. and also what i i realized was missing that uh, i saw 
just a few trees around and it mm. was concrete and buildings and concrete and buildings and I, it made me depressed actually so it, it was mm. i guess at least half a year till i noticed that this is going on and there are some green places but we were not so good at preserving parks for example, mm. or, or taking care of trees or green areas. And it's a constant, I think it's a constant battle because there are some districts and leadership and who decides what to build where and business versus ecology is always, I think, part of the mm -hmm. part of the story. I, I don't know much about the politics and other stuff, but mm. what I see is that, yeah, it's a very like pricey place to okay. buy anything in the uh, inner city. So if you have any kind of building that you can build, then wow, you make you make yourself rich. So mm. people just build and build and build. And I see that we had a, a nice park in the in the middle of a city, mm. and it, there were old trees, and it's been used for quite a while. And now they are reconstructing it. And it's huge debate was there. Like, okay, they are designing new buildings, and it. More people go there. More people do sports there. There are sports parks. And a lot of old trees are cut. They are cut oh, down. No. Okay. So it's interesting. So there's a, cause I mean, I know in a lot, I, I it can go either way, right? Because in a lot of big cities around the world now, they're trying to kind of increase the green space. This is like a new initiative, especially here in, in Europe. I know a lot of big cities are trying to uh, open up more green space and improve green spaces in mm. cities. And I mean, is there any initiatives like that in, in Budapest? I just heard some slogans for quite a while. And what I see doesn't reflect slogans. So I really hope that there are some better plans. I, yeah, I don't see okay. it happening, but <laughs> I'm in lockdown for a year almost. So <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's more greener. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, yeah, maybe just because people haven't been walking around, yeah. you know, the weeds are growing up through the, the sidewalks and, yeah, and yeah. stuff now. <laughs> All right. So you said that you grew up in the center of the, the country in Hungary. Yeah. And, and, and there it was much greener and you had some little trees around. So can you tell us a little bit about just like how you grew up and, and what kind of nature, what your nature connection was kind of growing up? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I like the question. It's, I, I grew up in a, in a town, it's town, 100,000 inhabitants. So it was, it, it was more well-built. What was the name of it? Kecskemét. It's called, Kecskemét. it's very famous, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, it's more like a city type of environment. Like you have taller buildings and more concrete. And what mm -hmm. shaped my uh, relationship to nature was that Every summer we went to the grandma's village and grandma mm. lived uh, on the southern part of the country at the end of the village. So it was almost like one of the last houses and every day we could go out and there was this assigned limit to our explorations that it said like you can go and play, but don't go further than the, the tall tree. There was a tall tree in the, mm. in the forest. So we could see that that's the demarcation line. and. We played in the dust. We were catching frogs and being attracted and afraid of all the insects. And we were looking down, looking at them. And also we went to the small, small river that, that was nearby also from time to time. So it was more this exploring and, and being in nature, not as an excursion, but on a daily basis. Hmm. All right. Yeah. Did you ever, I'm just curious, did you ever go beyond the tall tree? Of course. <laughs> of course we went and, <laughs> and we felt really guilty about it. And it, it, it was not really far, but it was more like, like fairy tale kind of adventure. So because it was mm. forbidden, then we crossed the threshold and wow, this is the, the real forest. But there was actually not a big, not big a difference there. Wow. Yeah, th yeah. There's so much uh, interesting stuff in your story, actually. For my first my first thing I'm thinking is that I've, I've met, I've talked to so many people who have had like similar stories about how they had a grandma and they would always go to grandma's house and grandma lived outside the city. And that's like where 
you really got to go and play in the forest. So it's interesting. A lot of a lot of grandmas around the world with houses in the forest. <laughs> That's uh, one interesting point. And also just, yeah, there's this, you know, there's always this idea of, you know, how they construct villages and whatnot. And they always have, especially in medieval times, they would, they would construct these villages where they'd have kind of like the church in the middle and then yeah. the market and then the people would live there. And then they had the village wall or like the boundary, you know, and it was always, oh, don't go out beyond the wall. You know, that's where the, the witches and the ghouls live yeah, you know, yeah. and the, or the other people that aren't from here. So, uh, yeah. Just a phony, 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 phony theme that still pr- prevails. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and you know what? Just one thing came up in my mind. Yeah. That, uh, I I was growing up in this town, so it's quite. It was quite a big town with hundred thousand inhabitants. So we had a, like city kind of infrastructure. And when I went to the village, I took the narrative of my grandmas, and they said like, never go to further than the big tree, and never cross the. They said the, the rocky road. And mm. that was the only, only In road, downtown. which is was asphalt road going through the huh. village. All the other roads were uh, dirt roads. Dirt roads, yeah. So it was, but I knew a lot of rocky roads, but in my mind, the rocky road was way more dangerous than the ones I walked on every day when I was at home in the town. Mm. Because it was the rocky road. And there was the big <laughs> tree and the rocky road. And it was like, who something magic is going on there. <laughs> <laughs> And, if, and, 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 and yeah, yeah. So these were, these were your setup. These were your boundaries at that point in time. Yeah. And it seems to me, I don't know, just, you can, you can tell us a little bit more about it, but you've, you've definitely lived uh, a life uh, that has exceeded a lot of boundaries in the past. You've, you've been in a lot of different places around the world, working in uh, outdoor and experiential education and how, how do you think do you think that your you know grow, your nature connections as a child and those experiences do you think they had some influence on what you've been doing since then in your work with outdoor and experiential education There's some yeah. motivation in there yes yes one impact of my childhood was i felt i think i felt more at home with with being in nature and with and being at home with the messiness of nature, like things just grow as they grow, and also with this slow pace of nature because of the mm. village times. Like, yeah, nothing happens there all day long. You just play in the garden or on the street or in the forest, and mm-hmm. there's no entertainment happening to, to keep you busy. You yeah. explore and mm. and you pay attention so that's that's one thing being at home with it was one one thing and also i was yeah i was thrilled by the exploration of wow it's amazing that we have these uh, these natural sites and and all beings around mm. and i i forgot this after a while in the m- more educated part of my life like my teenage years and also uh, university times and when I started to to work as an outdoor educator, I felt like coming home. Like, okay, this is this is home for me to some extent. And also, it's getting more and more important that this is this cannot be taken for granted. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. It's it's not the Himalayas or not uh, Patagonia or whatever. Mm-hmm. We have the smaller scale of nature in Hungary. And it's still amazing that we can still share this planet with these plants and animals. So, yeah, just explore and value them more. Yeah, I mean that, that's beautiful to hear, man. Because I think that it is it is so important to that that just we humans in general aren't so caught up in these kind of like very chas- charismatic like megafauna, you know, kind of places, you know, the, yeah, sure. It might be nice to go visit the Galapagos islands. It might be nice to go visit the Himalayas and stuff, but I always like to say, yeah, but right next to those really tall mountains that are attracting all of the tourists, there's, you know, some other, a little bit smaller mountains, just as beautiful or maybe, and nobody goes there, you mm-hmm. know, and, 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 you know, you can go in your flat backyard and find all kinds of things to explore. So there's a lot of, hyping up of a lot of these places but i think it's so great to hear 
that you found a way to kind of just explore the, the area around you. And, 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 and it's arguably, I mean, I think it's inarguable. This is even a more sustainable way to explore it too in the, in the long run. So it's good sentiment to pass on through the, the airwaves. I, I want to ask you a bit more about, of course, like how you finally arrived back in outdoor education. But before we get there, I was just curious a bit about, you know, you said during, <clears throat> once you got a, a bit more into, you know, I guess growing up high school, you, got, you said you were getting higher in your education. You came a bit disconnected from that memory of your grandma, grandma's house and exploring nature. And you know, is that something that just happened to you? Because I'm also curious a little bit about the general consensus of, you know, Hungarian nature connectedness. Like, is there, you know, I can say from up here in Norway, there's a very strong national narrative, cultural identity associated with going outside, being outside. It's almost like everybody is their own kind of outdoor outdoor, you know, practitioner in a way. Uh, I don't expect that from other places so much. This is quite unique here, but you know, is there, is there any kind of, you know, general consensus or connection with Hungarian and outdoor culture, Hungarian outdoor culture, I wow. should say. Sorry, kind of a long question. <laughs> no, it's a good question. Really, I really yeah. like it. Yeah. The answer is totally subjective. So it's mm -hmm. what I see. Yeah. There has been in the second part of the last century, mm -hmm. some trend towards hiking and exploring Hungarian forests and and like marking hiking trails and and mm. this this movement was there but okay. it, it was not not this technical type of outdoor or more skilled type of outdoor movement that we see today and i think it's due to the times and also it may have to do something with the, the environment we we have not the difficult terrain to mm. that way as, as you have in mm -hmm. Norway. And the other thing was that um, it's not that big of a business, I would say, to come here for the environment itself. Yeah, mm. it is very, very nice. And still, if if you go for, I don't know, rock climbing, mountaineering, you may go to the Tatras or Transylvania or or the, uh, what I see in the neighboring countries or Austria, the Alps. So we don't have this... Type kind of, of like attraction. high adventure kind of stuff. Yeah, and, yeah. The, and also ju not just the adventure part, but if you want to go to to see some higher peaks and beautiful mm -hmm. landscapes, you have the Alps and the Tatras all around, and and also uh, the Carpathian Mountains, mm -hmm. and people go there for that. And those countries, in my view, seem to be more accustomed to go outside and do skiing and hiking mm -hmm. and being more outdoorsy type. Mm -hmm. In Hungary, it's increasingly important, I would say, and I, I, th I see it as a nice trend. Mm -hmm. And still, we are not aware of the places that we have mm. because they are not, as you said, not that not that tall, not that shiny, but mm -hmm. we have some very, very nice forests hidden in the country and nice uh, hills. Absolutely. We call them mountains, by the way. So we call them mountains. <laughs> they are our mountains, but they are the pre-mountains of the Tatras and the Carpathians. And if someone comes here from real mountain country, they hear, ah, let's go to the mountains. And they just watch like a mountains. Where, where are the mountains? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I can I can relate because I, I don't know if I mentioned this, but I'm originally from the United States. I'm from Florida, which is about one of the flattest places you can ever find. And anywhere I go where there is a hill, it looks like a mountain. So, yeah, if you asked me, I've been I've been to Hungary before. And I, 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 in my mind, I think, oh, there's mountains in Hungary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have little mountains around here and most people just call them the hills. But for me, whew, those are some, that's all the mountains I need really, you know? Yeah. And, and I think it's, uh, yeah. So what do you think, what do you think is increasing this trend for more people to be noticing the outdoors and, in, and going out into the outdoors in Hungary? Yeah, one, one thing I, I see that people who visit neighboring countries see this culture of going to nature mm. and they bring it home. That's one thing. Mm. The other thing is uh, equally important that this more ecological thinking and thinking about the environment we have brings our attention to, okay, what's going around? What are these plants and what's going on with the animals? 
Mm-hmm. Also, like, we have people watch these movies like David Attenborough telling about stuff around the world, like what's going on, amazing places. And then you explore, okay, wh- what do we have? So I see this, but it's it's not a not a huge trend, I would say. And mm-hmm. there are some initiatives like how to bring kids to the forest in schools and this kind of activities, I would say. But I don't see that they have a a very strong impact right now. Mm-hmm. I would say this ecological thinking is one of the strongest ones. Like, okay, how do we take care of our forests? Mm. But I, I don't see this as a, as a strong one. Not strong enough, I would say. Yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna ask you that. You know, can you can you give us a little bit of insight for those of us that aren't so familiar with the the ecological scene in Hungary? Are there you know? Can you are there any major ecological issues that are happening that we should be aware of? I would say like like deforestation has mm-hmm. yeah, it's been happening for centuries. So we mm-hmm. we have. Just the forest that been left that's been left bare there, mm-hmm. mostly in in hilly mountain areas, and also the the riverside areas have, have some some forests, some more wet parts of the country, and the ecological issues. I think like we, now we or I I talk more about forests when I mention mm-hmm. nature, but most part of nature is agriculture. And okay. cities. So, so issues uh, that I hear is more about that are more about what crops do we grow, what what kind of plants do we take care of, and what about what about the insects, the bees. Okay. Uh, so these kind of issues, and also the the other part is that it's hard to talk about nature and just focus on this small country we have. Mm-hmm. Because when we had some poisoning in in some of the rivers, one of the second biggest river in the country, yeah, it's it was due to some mining activity in a neighboring country. So there's cooperation needed. It's more a global issue. So we need to really watch the bigger picture. Like geologically, this region is a continuous region, and also we had one. It's hard to I don't know in English. That was not. There was some chemical sewage container, like a huge dam, mm. Mm-hmm. and it was not well built. So we had this issue of the dam was breaking and all this poisonous chemical material was poured down to a village. And yeah, we faced that it was hurting people and it was hurting nature at the same time. And one question was like, yeah, the dam was not well built, but but the other question is like, why do we keep such stuff there? Yeah. Why is it not being maintained? And, and then, yeah. And then why are we using this, you know, source of energy perhaps or this old technology and. Yeah. And yeah, energy so. issues also. I, I think it's a huge debate in Hungary, like renewable energy sources versus nuclear. And also we still use some carbon based. Like yeah. And gas. I think, I think your, your example, especially of the rivers, you know, I think Hungary, am I correct that Hungary is a landlocked country? Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's a landlocked country. So, I mean, I think your example of the rivers particularly was a very good example because, I mean, Hungary is historically, from what I understand, a very big kind of like intersection of a lot of different cultures and empires and like all kinds of history going on there. As well, the rivers are undoubtedly extending out through all these other countries. So it is very much an intersection of a lot of different ecological and yeah, sociological issues. So let's get let's let's get into your your work as an educator. I'm curious, like, so you you are a uh, leader at the Academy of Experience. Sounds like a wonderful <laughs> place to me. I want to go there, uh, <laughs> and because I just I'm obsessed with experience, and I think that this is just the key to learning, at least for a lot of people, people like me, for sure. And so, yeah, what 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 kind of brought you to this? What motivated you to start working with people? through experiential education. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, How'd we you get started with that. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> yeah, we it's it might it might sound something big like the academy of experience. Wow, it's a huge institution. <laughs> yeah. Just to, just to be clear, it's an NGO in Hungary. <laughs> mm-hmm. And yeah, we're located in Budapest and uh, we, more of our activities or 
at least like yeah i would i would say all of them are somewhere outside of budapest in hungarian natural sites and how mm. did i end up here like i started to work in a foster home mm. in in foster care in hungary we still have some these bigger institutions for children growing mm. up outside of family and yeah th- these like these are bigger institutions like ha- like roughly 100 children lived lived there and i worked there for 5 years and it i found it, my calling there like this is some real issue happening like these children have lived through some some traumas or or very adverse situations and they still have a lot of issues going on in the foster home and it's really hard to get closer to healing i would say or mm. getting a a healthier adult life and the other challenge they faced was in a family when i when i grow up my support system doesn't leave me alone or i'm i'm not on my own when i'm 18 or or 21 or 24 hmm. when these kids leave at some point in their life to foster care because yeah I, I was still older but still today if i have some issues some tough situations i have a lot of people who i can call or mm. if i if i wouldn't have a place to sleep i get homeless i just call my family and i have roof over my head so this this really struck me like okay how do we have these children to prepare or to learn in a meaningful way because if we just count them every day that oh yeah all of them are home and we also fed them then the job is not done so we are not just sheltering them and i also found this situation quite challenging because because of the behaviors or symptoms they show due to the traumatic upbringing they easily drop out of school and they easily or they easily just survive school but the, mm. the learning doesn't really happen in this sense of preparing to your life and what i, I discovered that if i just ask them do you want to come for a hike or just let's play down the, in the park of the foster home they are very much attracted so it's it sounds like something else a different place of learning than the school mm. and they also really 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 enjoyed doing stuff so learning by doing was more yes. of their stuff and not just uh, that type of learning where you are assessed all the time and also you're compared to some standards but mm. those type of learning when you see your your own progress so you get feedback on wow now you can do this wow you see you do this and also that type of learning like if we go for a hike for example and we take care of our own stuff it's cooperative stuff it's not individual work so they also can experience taking care for others and being cared for and uh this was really cool and i explored more and after some exploration around the education sphere i got to know experiential education outdoor education and all these non-formal education types if i want to label them but but i met outdoor bound outdoor outward bound romania mm. and i went there also to to learn from them and and work for them for a while so that's that's one of my alma mater or where where i learned this stuff from and also the academic experience was was the other one because they are cooperating organizations and uh, outward bound romania helped us to to found this organization and to maintain so they are constant source of inspiration too wow okay so that that's that's amazing so it sounds to me like you kind of found yeah, as you said, you found your calling when you were working at this foster home and through your own experience there, it just it, the, then that kind of led towards this outdoor, more formalized version of like outdoor and experiential education, which I think is, 
you know, pretty amazing because I, I feel like a lot of people and there's nothing wrong with that, but I feel like a lot of people are first very interested in like the outdoors and stuff. And they're like, I want to work in the outdoors. And then they find some kind of way to like apply that to some issue that they're interested in. But you actually kind of found it in a uh, quite almost the, in the reverse way. Uh, that's, that's, that's really cool. That's really cool. And I, I, it, when you say learning by doing and all this stuff, it just, it gives me chills because I fully believe in this. And I know as a, as a, I, as an experiential learner myself, and you probably are too. I mean, we all are to a certain extent, but we, we recognize we're experiential learners. It's just such, such a wonderful method to, uh, or just perspective to like educate and help from. So this work with the, and, and, and so this work that you do with the Academy of Experience, what it's, can you, can you give us an overview of the kind of programs and, and, and where it is and how that works? And mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. We, we do the, the one part of our work is youth work. So it's directly targeting youth and we mm -hmm. do all kinds of youth work. We give programs, for example, schools, like school mm. classes or excursions. They are called excursions, but like one, two, three day long programs. And uh, the main purpose is there to, to uh, I don't like the word team building, but really mm. increase the cooperation, the cooperation and capacity of, of school classes because they are, mm. they have to, they are together. They have to be together. I mean, like, yeah, yeah that was by chance, like we are this class, life brought, yeah. brought us this situation. And it's also an opportunity to, to cooperate and appreciate each other. So to use a uh, outdoor environment in an, in an appreciative way towards nature. So explore it a bit because it's a bit different environment than in most, than more, than most kids grow up in. And also as mm -hmm. a, as a tool or a field for appreciating each other. And in that sense, what we do with these regular classes is also contribution to education because in most Hungarian educational settings, the, the children are used to some more linear thinking about learning. So mm. if I learn something, then it means that I answer some questions. This is a generalization, but still I answer some questions that the teacher knows the answer to. So if mm. I'm, I'm looking for some answers, I need to look at the teacher and see like, if there's a nodding and uh, acknowledgement, like, yeah, yeah, good, good student. Then I, then I was learning. And more yeah, and very, more, very like traditional kind of rote learning. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, I know, I know the answer that the teacher wants me to say, and they yeah. will check the box and yeah. I will pass. And the there's box. only one yeah. answer. Mm -hmm. And the answer is already known. Mm -hmm. And uh, it doesn't give me the responsibility to look for answers and have the word, have the, have mm -hmm. the chance to say like, is this good enough for me? So this... I think this helps a lot in preparing for adulthood also. Mm. Like if we are on a hike or we need to navigate, we need to come to a way of cooperation and some conclusions like, is this good direction? How do we know? Hmm, do we trust these signs? Hmm, can we mm -hmm. use this compass well? Yeah, okay, let's give it a try. And then we should be okay with making mistakes and learn from them. Like, okay, okay, this was not a good direction. Let's go back. And nature gives us a chance to practice this and also it, it's really good because it gives direct feedback pretty much like it's mm. raining, it's raining. So you need to do something about it. So we have this part of the work uh, with the classes, but we have another part of our target group, which are, well, let's put it that way, disadvantaged youth. I don't know. It's, it's really hard to, to call a bunch of mm. human beings like, okay, disadvantaged, but it's easier to tell what, what's going on. Mm -hmm. Some of them grew up in foster care mm -hmm. and the other, other group of youngsters we work with, uh, grow up in, uh, extreme poverty mm. in segregated Roma settlements. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's an issue of racism issue of poverty at the same time. So it's, it's also a very 
challenging environment where they grow up in. And so this is the youth work part, youth work part of our work. And also we work with youth workers, so people who support youngsters. And I think we have some quite some experience in supporting disadvantaged youth and using outdoor tools also. All right, great. So yeah, let's talk about it. So I mean, where to start? I know it's a the the let's say the I guess we could say the Roma diaspora all over the world. And I'm not sure, you know, everybody, maybe everybody listening, but I'm not sure everybody out there really understands the context that this group of people is dealing with throughout the world. Do, I mean, I'm not asking you to be like, you know, sole representative of speaker for the Roma community, but can you maybe tell us a little bit about the situation that these communities are experiencing in yeah, your area? In mm-hmm. Hungary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you for this question. It's not not very often asked, actually. Yeah, it's also and also it's part of the story. Like yeah. uh, our story here together, we live together. What I really love in my work that I learn about not just the place I live in, but also the people who I share the place with. So who who lives in this country? When I when I was growing up, I was pretty much restricted in this small bubble that I had, like my family and like similar kids that I I was. And uh, it's kind of a hidden story, I would say, because it's not mm. so openly spoken about in in a real sense. We we had the Roma diaspora, part of the Roma di- diaspora in Hungary, and and Roma communities were not not settled part of society for quite a while. So there was Mm. an issue of this travel lifestyle, Mm -hmm. how they call them, the Roma people in in the UK. Mm -hmm. And they were living on the edges of villages, towns, Mm -hmm. like it's, it's a brief picture what I would like to give, but what I sense now is that there was some pressure to to push people to settle and be more controlled. Like we want to see what mm-hmm. you're doing. We want to, we want to have more control over what you do. And it's in this control, you can, you can see all attempts by state, a stronger mm-hmm. presence of state during the 19th, 20th century. So mm-hmm. you should educate your kids. They should be, I don't know, taken care for health wise. We know what's best for you. You should live like that. Like. So a lot of things were happening. And we had this communist socialist era in a, in a country where they were pushed to work in uh, factories and in industry general. And why I say this is because after the change of the political systems, there was this democratic period of the country in the past uh, 30 years and a lot of working facilities were gone a lot of companies just closed because they were state-run mm-hmm. facilities yeah. and in the eastern part of the country where most of these people live who are challenged by extreme poverty you have less work opportunities and you have a lot of issues accumulating and there were very weak attempts to address this on a social work level. So just to give you an example, I was struck by first time visiting a Roma settlement, like, okay, it's in the middle of this village. How did how did you end up having a settlement-like structure here, like people living in very poor conditions? And they said, it, the leaders of the uh, town or smaller town village at that time thought that all people with uh, some mental disability or who were facing some complications uh, with police or who had any difficulties with the authorities were pushed there to live in this circus vans. Mm. So it actually what I see more and more that regulating and restructuring cities, eastern cities of the country means that we push poor people out of the city mm-hmm. but we don't think about uh, okay if you push people to harsher conditions and you force them to live together 
the ones who would need maybe more support and more compassion from the from other members of that community then you you pile a lot of challenges and problems on top of each other yeah so right now we have some communities who have like one of the largest is roughly 3000 people live in the just the outside of a bigger city in the mountain area with uh, no electricity and water mm. and uh, they live in old miners houses like some live in houses some even live in slum like conditions like yeah almost like tents or huts and it's very harsh yeah yeah, I mean, from what I understand in, in my research and also in my own contact with the Roma com communities and friends here in Norway and when I used to live in Germany, it's an extremely complicated issue, which uh, we probably won't be able to dissect wow. on this podcast today. But but this is a big focus of your work is working yeah. in, the, in, these, in these parts of your community. So... Yeah, how does that work out? What exactly are you doing there? How did that get started? Mm -hmm. And how did these programs get started? And what are, what's, what are they consisting of here? Yeah, we, we discovered that we work with kids in foster care. And some of them are Roma kids. Mm. And we got interested in, okay, but like, how do people get into foster care? And also, they have some questions coming up regarding their identity. And it's it's a huge question, like, okay, who am I? Mm. And it's really hard to also to leave these communities because then you're in no man's land. And then after a while, we we turn towards cooperating with organizations who support Roma communities on a local level. So as you said, like you cannot generalize or di dissect this whole issue here, mm. but we see that local issues need to be faced. So you cannot give a one size fits yeah. all solutions. So we started to cooperate with organizations supporting Roma communities. And we discovered that what works with foster care, children living in foster care, could be really used for supporting them because they also like learning by doing more. Dro mm. being Dropping out of school is a huge issue. Experiential learning is something they, they really feel uh, close to. And mm. we thought like, if, okay, if we wanna have an impact the teenage years, early teenage and teenage years is the right time when we can shape their adulthood also. They are members of a family and a community and still it could be really great that if we invite them to have some experiential learning activities that they can use when they go home. And the first type of activity was not this excursion because if you go to a Roma community and you just say, hi, I'm from the capital <laughs> and I came to invite your kids to an excursion, then quite understandably, they would, wouldn't would trust you. Like they say, like, okay, yeah. come on, what, what's the, what, is, what is this about? <laughs> and so that's yeah. why we don't. And, and I, I wonder, in they pro and there's probably a lot of mistrust because, uh, in my, uh, because, of the, because of the systemic like marginalization of yes. these you know, through the state and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When they met authorities, yeah. like if someone comes for something that you should be very suspicious about it. Like, yeah. uh, okay, we'll see. Yeah. And what I discovered in the foster home and also what, one of our programs that we really love to organize is uh, experiential learning by, by the means of volunteering projects. Mm. So what we love in nature is that it's real. So you don't have scenarios or fake situations. I mean, like just play like situations, but it's really real. And having this sense of real responsibility very much attracts these youngsters because they see that these adults really trust me. So if we mm -hmm. make, I have, I can make the fire, I get to cook and we eat the food for real, then it's, getting a taste of responsibility more and more and trust. And I think it's huge in outdoor education. That's why expeditions are used all, all around the world. And we saw that 
adding to this recipe, we sh we should also we could also use caring for others and connections. So if we say, just like in an expedition where we say to the kids, okay, we prepare you, we're with you, but you will do the navigating, you will make the shelter, you will cook, and we rely on you. Mm. They feel really, in a good sense, excited and challenged, like, okay, come on, let's do this together. So it's a good cooperative learning project. And if we have the same attitude towards volunteering and we say to them that, look, we have a budget and here is this country and you can help wherever, whomever you wish to help. <laughs> Decide Agreed. within yourself who you want to help and how you want to do it and plan it and ask for needs and really just do the planning and then let's go and do it. And this is very, very attractive because uh, mostly these youngsters meet situations where they are the ones who are helped or treated like someone needing help. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it might be that not everything is perfect in your life and you have a lot of capacity and competences that you can use and you can really contribute to others at the same time. Maybe they they have deeper compassion because they know how it feels that not everything is okay in a family. So they really like this, this type of activities. And what we do is that this program of ours is called From Us to You. This is the name that they give. Mm -hmm. They gave to the program. They named it. Amazing. And yeah, we stick, we stick with it. And, uh, and why From Us to You is because yeah, we are also helped but we can help you too. So this is the message that they, that they thought it's important. And it's a multi-modular program. We have just one part when they, we meet each other and they have a chance to check around who's here in the team of mm. youngsters. And also it's a chance for the families to see that this type of invitation that we, we propose, like come to this camp, so-called camp mm -hmm. it's a shorter three-day program usually where they can test it out and practice like what does it mean to go away from home and go back so family and also the kids see that this is safe this is fun i want to go mm -hmm. back and when they come back they face this challenge like okay if you want to help somewhere where is it so after team building part we do this planning part and then they go back because it's quite exhausting. This is usually four or five days of planning because mm -hmm. we do we keep on using also outdoor elements in this whole process. So nature is part of part of the whole thing because we thought we find that using outdoor education can help them to prepare to face this bigger challenge of a complex volunteering program. And if I understand right, is this this is an era related to the Erasmus program? No, uh, we oh. we find different fundings, whatever. Okay, when when you say that they they go and visit the other like participants and stuff, is this within Hungary or is this international? No, it's 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 in Hungary. So it's okay. language is a huge barrier. So mm -hmm. we are now working on bringing it to international level, but we mm -hmm. do a lot of. Erasmus Plus activities, but these programs, like they come together. I, I think it's it's crucial that you leave your community. It's, yeah. it's a huge step for them, mm -hmm. for everyone. And yeah. you don't meet in someone else's community, but you meet in a third place. Mm -hmm. So you get to construct the way of being together. So how uh, how are we here? How should we behave? Like what's good for you and mm -hmm. then you negotiate and also you can have a it's experiential learning in a very deep sense because you experience all the time that you can have a say in stuff and you are part part of the creators of this community so it's not just you are told to behave like this or that 
Yeah, wow. I I really love uh, the sound of your program. It's uh, to me, it sounds a lot. You, you know, it's a it's a very in many educational scenarios, it's very overlooked the power of the facilitator. You know, I don't know if you think of yourself as a facilitator, but that's just how I'm envisioning yeah. it. Like, you know, the power that working with youth or really working with any like group of people, you know, giving others agency to make their own decisions in kind of like a secure environment, you know, where experimentation and exploration is available is incredible. I mean, I've seen it, you know, in, in my own classes and, and also I've, you know, participated in some exchange programs that are, you know, in a similar format, kind of what it sounds like you're talking about. And it, it really is just so important to just, yeah, give people this kind of like democratic, like self-directed uh, agency to uh, w- work together, you know? Mm-hmm. Because, yeah, like you said, a lot, a lot of people and these children, they come from, you know, houses, probably the, their, their parents are always telling them what to do or their teachers are always telling them what to do. And then, like you said, in this form of education, it's just they are just giving the right answer just so they can pass the test and stuff like that. And... And this just sounds wonderful. And, you know, I think also a really interesting point you brought up is the fact that it's just even just getting out of these communities and getting to other communities and, and other people coming from their communities and going to these communities is just a very localized but extremely valuable and important form of exchange. Where, again, it's very localized, like how we were talking earlier in the conversation about it's just nice just to go out and visit the flatlands around and the tiny mountains right in your yeah. neighborhood. What? What kind of, so just give us some examples, like what kind of projects are these, these kids working on? Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. Like it was a learning from our side also, like we were first quite anxious, like, okay, what, what would they pick? Should we have? So the first edition, we thought like, okay, we give them some list of villages that are very poor and they can choose or, so it's a, it was hard to let their hands go and let them do the stuff and after a while mm. we just let them come on let, like they they can decide we can help them with information if they ask for it and we can help them with resources but they will decide and what we found that they tend to uh, lean towards picking communities they heard of so, mm. so a place where they know someone and they feel more the human need for something. So it's not just statistics or the internet told me that that's a poor part or people live there, but I can picture it as a human community. And uh, they contact these communities. And in the past years, we've been doing this for 10 years. Oh, wow. In the past years, they pick uh, Roma communities around the country and this this is a quite recent change in the program that during we have these four phases team building planning then realizing the volunteering project and then we come together to celebrate and reflect and Mm. during this planning part some people some kids who come from a community started to advertise their own so it's (laughs) like come to us we have a lot of things to uh, take care for and we asked around and people need this and it would be great to play with the kids and we took us amazing it's, it's great sign because uh, they don't feel ashamed to show themselves they wow. feel okay to, to show vulnerability like yeah at home not everything is perfect let's change it and what they come up with is partly basic handicraft kind of helping so what they can do which is not professional work, like painting, reconstructing stuff, building simple stuff like fireplace or a goal for football. So this kind of easy stuff. And it's part of their excitement to try out, try out things. Like, can I paint? I don't know how to do it. So let's, let's do that. Let's learn from each other. And partly it's cooking, community meal, cooking. Usually it's done with some local women and it's great encounter. And a lot of it is uh, leading activities for younger kids. So children mm. activities. So it's events they organize. That's, that's what they end up with. 
because of I th- I think it's it's a really good example that they can really evaluate their competencies as a group so they they can see that okay what is our chunk here what can we do mm. within this time frame within this budget and given that we are the group and also the other thing is that they grew up in communities where family plays a big role or if they come from some of them come from foster care they know the importance of caring for children so that's mm. that's a very important priority for them and and there's a lot of kids who are not taken care for so they are just on the street so mm. the kids are on, who are on the street i think it's a good evaluation of the situation that they come from the families where things are not going well mm. so if they have activities they do this and uh, I, we celebrate this pretty much because if you asked any teacher or any facilitator to go there and lead some activities to the kids in any settlement they would rate it as high challenge i would say mm. it's not structured they are not in a class you need to really be very flexible and react to very challenging situations and they do amazingly well and i would say that they are learning about healthier ways of interaction with children mm. so i i think it contributes to them being a better parent that's my hope mm. better parents better people yeah yeah so since there is like so much freedom involved in agency uh, for the individuals involved in these programs and, and just to clarify Am I right that you the the main group the main exchange going on is between these uh, groups of foster children and with the Roma communities that they are deciding to work together with? Yeah, it's it's a mixed group of youngsters, okay. and we, each edition of this program ch- changes like it varies a lot. Mm-hmm. We okay. try to include kids coming from different background, maybe families, mm-hmm. so have a more inclusive program. Yeah, it's. It's our attempt on the long run, like, okay, have having more or a goal to have more inclusive programs. We have very good experience mm-hmm. with that. But at the same time, if you get funding, you get only funding for certain amount cert- of people and certain type of target groups. So if you oh, say okay. like, okay, I, half of the group will be coming from families, then you need to really reason or find a good donor for that. Okay. And I was going to say with all, what do you see your role in all of this, like as a facilitator? Because it sounds rather hands off almost. And I think, like Ah. you said, a lot of teachers and stuff would find this challenging, but for you, it's what you do, you know? Yeah. it's Yeah. The part that we do in the program or Mm -hmm. these type of programs, you you mean? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, like as a facilitator being there, mm. uh, you're not just standing in front oh. of the class telling everybody what to do. So, yeah, how, wh- where do you see your role? Because I think a lot of us listening out here may also see ourselves as facilitators. I know I'm, I'm very interested always in how people kind of negotiate their role as a facilitator in in a such a setting. Mm. Yeah, I think yeah, it's not this laissez-faire type of thing like, okay, kids, come here and do whatever you want and we're okay mm-hmm. with it because it's not the invitation and it's not not concrete enough. So we invite them to have fun. So we are some kind of people who invite them to do fun new activities. Mm-hmm. Yeah, And we invite them to play games or mm-hmm. to do some challenges. So how can you do that kind of thing? Mm-hmm. As an expedition to the... Woods is this kind of the invitation. Like, wow, you can do this for sure, and and let's see how you do it. Where and just where are you inviting them from? Is this just a random sampling of the community or a specific school or specific so we just neighborhood go to the community you target? And mm. we just tell them what this program is about and okay. talk to the uh, people who are interested. And also, we talk to teachers, local NGO, and maybe if if there's some questions and interest we talk to families also so mm-hmm. it happen it, if you go to a new place where they don't know us it's good to have a meeting with people interested and also with parents interested so they see us 
we meet in person they see what kind of here and what kind of people we are mm -hmm. yeah and i just mentioned like what is the facilitation so we are this playful inviting people to do new stuff mm. that can be fun or can be challenge or a mixture of that but the most important part of this that we do this as people who are curious about the youth so the most important part is being curious about them and we invite them to these activities as chances to show themselves mm. so it's not that tests or assessment of their behavior but really highlighting the resources we see in them and it's a, it's a huge thing and very important thing to appreciate little things that happen in front of our eyes and uh, reinforce them and just really really acknowledge it like wow you did that it's great it's great you're expressing yourself or it's great you're taking care of yourself please come back whenever you want like mm -hmm. so it's not not forcing them to do stuff and the next part of our activity or as a facilitator is generating interactions within the peer group so it's mm -hmm. these programs are not about the adults incredible wisdom and we share our wise thoughts or whatever but it's more mm -hmm. giving them a chance to to get in touch with new teenagers with new people mm -hmm. and also giving them a chance to be appreciative and cooperative within the group yeah the adults are just there kind of holding the framework together yeah. a little bit making sure everybody's safe and <laughs> organizing the food and oh but, but it sounds like the, the even the key participants organize a lot of that kind of stuff yeah. but yeah you're there for the we use a lot of team um, coaching stuff sorry just just to add oh a yeah, lot yeah. Of team coaching so more more coaching kind of interaction with the kids mm. and team mm. coaching kind of interaction and and thanks for mentioning and safety is one of our concerns that we we need to be aware of meaning physical and emotional safety of the youngsters given their background and also taking care of the outdoor activities, we needed to learn a lot about physical safety. Yeah, so everybody's also yeah ready and kind of qualified for that. I should have asked this earlier, actually, because you mentioned that you usually get, you know, different groups to do this exchange and then you'll eventually meet at like a third area that neither is really connected to. So do you actually have like a, a, a specific area or do you have like a center or how does that work? Where no, we don't. We don't have. We are playing with the idea of having a center. Mm -hmm. as an investment but no we 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 have some set of venues we use which are mm. close or in natural sites that we use and are not really far from the youth we work with so they are in a good location for the concrete group of youngsters to get together because also we we have some camps for foster care kids so foster mm -hmm. care camps and mm -hmm. if we want to invite them to do to, to come to camp it shouldn't be really really far yeah no and i think that's you know wonderful because you i mean it makes more sense it's maybe not necessary quite to have like a, a a single place because you're moving around all these different communities dealing with all different kinds of people all the time in the work that you do with all of these communities do you get how much support do you get from like your community and also do you get any pushback you I'm mean just curious. community meaning uh society so it's a broader yeah mm -hmm. yeah uh, well i would say we are quite lucky because um, mm -hmm. working in, with youth is something that people appreciate and we get a lot of support and we are meaning like people acknowledge our work mostly so we don't really face a lot of a lot of pushbacks directly I don't know about opinions of, of people who don't express, but think like, ah, come on, this no sense in what you do. I know about that, that some people think that, no, you cannot do anything with these youth. They end up in jail. And mm. unfortunately, you hear racist ideas a lot. And it's a, it's a big issue in our country, too, that people don't have a broader understanding of the impact of trauma, the conditions in extreme poverty and what it takes to to have a 
better i don't know to see better patterns for parenting for example if you're if you're abused or hurt when you're a child mm-hmm. and also the impact of racism it's not really yes. spoken of in in this Hungarian like the national dialogue or national dialogue and in education so it's it's, it's not a, not an open topic i would say it's not an open topic in a sense that you can talk about the human reality of it mm. so i have roma colleague several roma colleagues and friends who share their personal experience and then you see okay what does it mean how hard it is to to leave a community and to, to go somewhere to find a job what challenges they face usually mm. you just uh, hear the sentences like oh come on they have it in their blood they end up in jail and it's re- really hurtful but when we work with these communities we don't face any pushback from any cooperating parties because we are on the same mission like we believe that mm-hmm. uh, this thing this thing can be changed and we can have a better way of yeah taking care but better way of taking care of each other and and addressing these issues we have but regarding support we we don't have uh, state support i would say we just apply for grants european grants and and individual donors who we think yeah yeah this work makes sense and is valuable so they just support our work we we could really really use more support <laughs> if that's the question <laughs> yeah so if if someone feels like come on this is good stuff and they they can just send us a few like a price for a coffee or or a, a few bucks or euros and you can you can name that okay let's uh, spend this money on the on the roma program like we are really happy for that we have some some options on our website too for this. We are we are getting better at that, like asking for donations to specific programs and and also we work uh, with the Roma and foster care youth group outside of programs. So constantly we are mentoring them. Yeah, I mean when you say we're working together, I mean it really is because I mean. Every, I think sometimes people forget when they're marginalizing these groups, people that were not all part of the same country or were not all part of the same community. In fact, yeah, you, you, you're kind of trying, I don't know, to me, it seems like you're, you're, you're doing a really great job at, yeah, kind of rebuilding like bridges or like interweaving the community because whether people, you know, like it or not, or whether people are racist or discriminatory or not, like actually everybody here is citizens or or residents or members of this community Mm -hmm. so tremendous last question i could talk about this all day Mm -hmm. yeah so i'm just curious you know to summarize you know when it comes to the future do you see like a connection between like your social work and with the environment and do you see how this works together do you have any goals for that yeah the future um, through these programs wow thanks for this question we see that we would like to use nature as we do right now, for sure. Keep on using that that way. Like meaning teaching leave no trace and also visiting natural sites to invite people to appreciate nature more. So it's one of one of our environmental educational goals, I would say. And the other thing that is getting more more and more into this picture or part of this picture is just being in nature as a tool. So it's not a direct focus, but practicing what does it mean to be in nature. And if we don't go for a long excursion or expedition or we don't do very challenging stuff, it still has an impact on us. So if we can choose to spend time in nature and at the same time practice what does it mean to take care for it, appreciate it, and also notice the difference it creates in us and the way we are together that's 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 a big thing and the third part is we are on the path of getting more and more environmentally conscious so being more and more green organization is one of our goals so show only by example what we mean to take care for nature when we are not out there but in the office too so that's, yeah, that's one of our goals. 
I, I want to just get, talk a little bit. I can't leave the podcast without talking about your podcast because this is how I actually first mm-hmm. found out about you is through your podcast, The Source. And I understand it was in Hungarian at first, and now it's 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 starting in English, yeah. so it can I guess reach a broader audience. So yeah, tell tell us a little bit about your podcast. Yeah, it's first we started the Hungarian version, so that line is running for yeah mm-hmm. almost a year now, and we just started this year the English, and it came from the lockdown situation. Like oh, okay, we cannot meet in person, mm-hmm. but what what if we just talked online and. Why don't we record conversations? And the mm-hmm. intention behind is that hmm, we meet extraordinary people, really, youth workers, mm-hmm. youth experts in some fields, that we like. We really find it amazing that people have so vast and very useful experience in working with other people or supporting people or supporting learning and growth that this should be spread. And also we we also we meet the needs or demand. Like if we meet a teacher or a social worker, they have tons of questions and they they always ask like, do you know someone who works with this or that? Or I don't know, I wonder where can I look for some inspiration in this or that field? And I always have a lot of people in my mind. Mm. And with those people in conferences, for example, or trainings, we have amazing conversations about very interesting, very useful stuff. Yes. But it's not spread. And we thought, okay, just give it a shot. Let's record conversations, edit them because some topics are sensitive, but let's let's cover topics that are quite relevant. And these topics are how to lead conversations, outdoor education, mental health issues, and a lot of things that are not narrowly focusing on outdoor education, but generally could be for anyone who's interested in supporting others. Could be family members also and parents. So parenting is one part of our our focus, but uh, facilitation and teaching and coaching and all kind of human interaction in learning field. So it's not therapy field, more learning field is what we shoot for. And also we listen to feedback, like what our listeners find useful. And the other thing is that regarding the format, we are still in in transition or or in in our journey, but one intention was bringing back the practice of dialogue. So Mm. there's a lot of commercial stuff or short stuff, like entertainment stuff. Like listen to this, 10 tips for, I don't know, being a better parent. And these mm-hmm, are complex mm-hmm. issues, like <laughs> people are complex. And what if we just uh, record a conversation which takes as much time as it needs? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And people just find out like, okay, we start somewhere end up, and end up in a different place. And later on, we're going to take out shorter bits and pieces, which are useful tips maybe, or I don't know, like around some topic. But we have longer format dialogue podcast yeah i love it yeah it's a very nice podcast and i have to say i almost feel like it it, it, it's very similar to how this podcast got started with just yeah always talking to so many different people all these conferences or just meeting people in schools or whatever and it's like this needs to be out there and you know especially you know also with a lot of academic research and work i mean people spending their whole lives either in the field or like in the computer doing research and stuff and then it gets you know it's either hiding in a classroom somewhere behind a stack of papers that someone's grading or 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 maybe in an outdoor center but people are you know kind of too busy to get the word out or maybe it's in some like stuffy academic journal somewhere which has like tremendous information But nobody can read it. I mean, even if you, I mean, sometimes it, sometimes it's more accessibly written than others. But at the same time, you might have to pay 150 euros to get access to this yeah. journal or something like so that. So it's hidden treasures. So, yeah. so, so much valuable knowledge out there that, yeah, I mean, people like you, people like me, these kinds of podcasts, we can, we can get that out there from our own unique perspectives that, uh, I don't know, hopefully reach, you know the wider audience because 
I don't know. It's just, you know, different forms of media. Yeah. So I think it's yeah. really, really cool what you're doing. Yeah, and also um, this, like what we do here. I think it's also cross inspiration because mm-hmm. some people, for example, in our case, we work with outdoor education. So we, most of our crew members can say like, come on, I'm experienced in outdoor education. But I have different mm-hmm. level of experience in supporting conversations or working with uh, mental yes. health issues. So what if we just learn on that field too? And I'm really mm-hmm. happy to say that in the upcoming episodes, we're going to have some conversations about peer support for facilitators and trainers, how to do mm-hmm. intervision, or there's another one on on how to use solution-focused coaching tools in listening when you talk about tough stuff. And there will be another with uh, an expert with on uh, suicide prevention and uh, trauma survivors. Mm. And if you're not exactly working on that field, you still can learn from that because you might might end up needing to address these these issues in your work. So Absolutely, it's good, to, good to get to know about it. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, you know, at least speaking for myself, I would, you know, even if I'm not working exactly with that, it just it's it's important to gain uh, understanding of what other people are how they're doing their jobs or what other people are struggling with you know to gain a greater understanding of the world build more empathy build more knowledge you know i mean i mean in, in even through i don't through podcasts through listening this is also an experience you know maybe we're not outside right now walking through the woods or maybe we're not baking a a pizza or something (laughs) like that you know which is all great learning experiences but uh, yeah we're here having an awesome conversation and in a way you know you know simply although it's it's not simple but by, by simply creating healthier you know physically and mentally healthier you know people a youth and they're going to grow up we can hope that this will lead to healthier decision making in the future so about environment and about society and whatnot so yo thank you so much apad for talking with me today well thank you very much for inviting and great to talk to you all right everybody and welcome back thanks for listening thanks for sticking around and i Really hope you enjoyed this conversation with Arpad Barnai. And please make sure to check out his podcast, The Source. And of course, I will leave links for both the podcast and Arpad's Academy of Experience down there in Budapest, Hungary. If you're interested to find out more, if you want to collaborate or just donate to the organization, that would be great. Contact Arpad. Now, I have to say I was really ecstatic to get Arpad here to talk today have this conversation and share his unique experiences adding of course to our growing atmosphere of transnatural perspectives but i was also very excited because in particular i've been searching for more information about work with the roma diaspora something that i just haven't seen much information on in the world of outdoor and experiential education now i could be wrong i could be missing something so if you know of more initiatives or perhaps research surrounding this topic please let me know i'll share it around i realize many of us listening may be familiar with the concept of experiential education whereas for others this may be an introduction however i think experience is something that we all have well experience with there's that old saying If a tree falls in the woods, but no one's there, did it make a sound? And I think the same can go for experiences. I ask, if an experience is not reflected upon, was it an experience at all? What did we learn from it? What is its value in our life? I'm not going to imply anything here, because I think there's many takes on that but I will just leave that with you as something to think about. But one thing I think we definitely can garner from our pod's work is that facilitating experiences can be a powerful method for providing space for youth and people of all ages for that matter to exercise their agency, practice responsibility and grow. 
it's an opportunity that comes easier for some people than others. And in some cases, we're not just talking about individuals, we're talking about entire social, cultural, ecological, or economic groups who have been marginalized out of crucial experiences, sometimes ostracized by the very communities that expect them to fulfill certain societal standards. Now, whether or not these standards are reasonable or just is in itself debatable. But generally speaking, how can anyone be expected to begin to even begin to fulfill the demands of any society when they've been marginalized out of access to learning experiences? As well, we well know now that institutionalized practice of systemic discrimination further destabilizes communities and keeps us from achieving eco-social sustainability. And this is something that universally impacts all the humans and all the more than human individuals and communities at large all around the world. So these are my transnational perspectives for today, everyone. Thanks for tuning in so much. And please, please, please make sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts, share wherever you share podcasts, and please consider supporting the show with a one-time or even better monthly monetary contribution. As always, I love to hear your questions, your comments, and your suggestions, so please reach out. And all info about all of this and more, all of our previous episodes, everything like that, can be found at transnaturalperspectives.com. That's it, everybody. I'm your host, Josh Bennett, and these are the Transnatural Perspectives for this episode. Until next time, get outside. Greetings, everyone. This is your host, Josh, here. Happy to say that the Trans Natural Perspectives podcast is brought to us by listeners like you. If you find value in this show and you want to help it grow, please consider sharing this podcast, writing a review, and supporting the show. Head on over to transnaturalperspectives.com to learn more about how you can contribute as a monthly subscriber, as a one time donor, as well as check out our blog. I invite you to contact me with any ideas you have for the show. If you'd like to be a guest, if you need a writer, or any other tips on further funding opportunities. I'd really love to hear from you. It keeps this show going, keeps me going. And with that being said, thanks for listening.